Welcome to Crazy Shit in Real Estate, a weekly podcast where I walk you through some of the wildest, most unbelievable stories you'll hear from the world of real estate. If you like real estate and you love crazy, this is the podcast for you. I know I'm moving offices, so like it is a mess in here. That's a wreck. And I'm like, okay, I need to find a decent angle before we get started. I like that blue though. That blue looks nice behind you. I have had that blue in my office for the last three offices, so. Well, it goes with the top you have on. I mean, it's very nicely played there, Kim. (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) Hey, so you know I've already started recording because that's how we roll, but I'm pretty sure that my viewers like the early conversations far more than they like the official part of the podcast. And if you're an audio listener, frankly, you're going to have to flip over to YouTube, but you will never know what we're talking about early. You're going to wonder why Kim is judging her own office. And if you see the video, you'll totally understand why she's judging her (laughs) office because it looks like a realtor office. In fact, I won't show that in my dining room, my whole dining room table is covered in stacks of paper. (laughs) I I don't like paperless. I am a paper girl. And so I have to plant trees to make up for all the ones that I use. And I'm not even going to apologize for that anymore. I'm same. My friend that was over here helping me put my desk together last week is like, we need to get you away from paper and I can't do it. I can't. And I'm a kinesthetic learner. And so if I don't write it, see it, touch it, feel it, it doesn't resonate with me. Yes. And that's what I think is what part of the challenge we'll see from this whole coronavirus era of sending our children home to learn. Any human who's a kinesthetic learner can't retain and learn through Zoom. It just doesn't happen. But All right. that's going to be over the heads of our elected officials. <laughs> ah! So anyway, hey, friends, welcome back to Crazy Shit in Real Estate. You know, I'm Lee Brown, and you can see my fancy virtual background is actually half a block down from my office at the corner of Union and Cabarrus. I moved my head so y'all can see Union Street. And my friend Michael Anderson took that photo, and he doesn't even know that I'm pimping it out, but I'm so glad I had him take some pictures (laughs) a long time ago that I could use in the Zoom world. And today I'm bringing y'all one of the bright spots in Nebraska real estate. She's also the bright spot in a lot of people's lives in the real estate profession nationally. She's a volunteer (laughs) and people say lots of nice things about you. So you don't even do all the nice things, but I hear a lot of um, smack talk too, but usually when people are drinking and it's generally the loving smack talk, you know, the kind you love. So anyway, welcome to the show, Kim. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, so tell people a little bit about yourself, where you're located, how long you've been in real estate, any of the little tidbits they should know. I mean, besides Nebraska, because we may have listeners on the coast that think the whole middle of the country is just one big state. They don't know. Yeah. And so Nebraska, you know, it takes about eight hours to drive east to west. So it is a big state right in the middle. We're not just a flyover state. I got licensed in 2006 after a six year stint in elementary education. Yeah. You knew exactly what I was talking about. I do. Learners. <laughs> <laughs> I had a 16 year old who dropped a welding and electric, uh, the electrical class, because what are you going to do during COVID for those classes? Seriously. But, Yeah. Um, So anyway, he's very kinesthetic and did not do well with the watch the video and take the test. So I got licensed in 06 and I started with one of the biggest companies in town. And then the 08 market came and crashed the world. I was lucky enough to be part of a team who was doing foreclosures at that time. So made it through ended up starting our own company out of that. And so I have been an owner since about 2010. And just last June, I am completely 100% the largest woman owned um, company in Lincoln, Nebraska. I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah. So it's been a really fun journey. I have had no plans of where my life would take me. I've just let the world take me where it will. So, (laughs) and frankly, that's what happens to a lot of us in real estate. You don't, you don't, you have no, any way of knowing what this business will do to your life because you take the licensing classes tells you nothing about survival in real estate, nothing about conducting real estate or about the 80,000 million paths you could go down. Right. But I'm curious though, you're now the largest woman-owned independent in Lincoln. 
When are you going to be the largest independent in Lincoln? <laughs> How close are we? What ranking are we? I'm actually not independent at the moment. Um, I am part of a franchise, but it is independently owned franchise. So depending on your vocabulary there, but I'm not sure that that's a goal of mine. So again, we'll see where the world takes us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Kim, you've been through a couple of different market disruptions. You've been through ups and downs. And of course, when you're conducting volunteer life, you get to see real estate in a whole different set of perspectives. I'd love to know what you want to tell about a story of your life in real estate that will qualify as the crazy shit that you never, ever saw coming. So being part of the foreclosure world, wow, um, I saw a lot of really crazy stuff. But I will say that the most talked about crazy thing is there was a home, a pretty affluent home in an affluent neighborhood that was full of mold. So this is the most talked about property it came up on uh, my his Facebook history a few weeks ago. I popped it back up on, and it's still probably the post with the most comments of all times on it. <laughs> there was mushrooms growing in the basement on the floor. All of the duct work was raining, dripping rain. The picture on Facebook is the bathroom, and it is like wallpaper or mold was the title that I put for it because it looks like the <laughs> 1960s, like purple and green and peach wallpaper, but it's really mold. So that is the craziest story um, that is talked about to this day. Okay, so how does a house get to that place when it comes to fungal growth? I mean, this is a question that a lot of consumers have. You can't breathe around that stuff. And those of us that are in real estate, even if you don't have a sensitive nose, you wind up being able to smell the difference in pet urine and human urine. Yes. And you can smell fungal growth and not fungal growth. You can smell if somebody has walked through the house with a cigarette versus smoked in the house. We know the differences. And so you found the same thing with clients too. They're like, how, how does it get there? So did that homeowner pee in the duct work or did they let the water run to piss off the bank? And why, how does it get that, that severe? Cause mushrooms growing inside is a special level of severe. Uh, wearing masks before it was cool in the foreclosure world. Allegedly what happened to that home <laughs> is that there was a bunch of material stuck into, it was a two story with a walkout basement. So three levels. Allegedly there was uh, something stuck in the uh, master bathroom sink on the top level and the water was turned on and the house was then vacated. So this happened in January and my property preservation guy was on scene right away, told the bank they needed to do something about it. Nothing was done. And we got the property, I believe it was like in June. So the water was turned off right away, but the neighbors had called. There was icicles forming on the outside. We're in Nebraska, it's cold. <laughs> yeah. Icicles forming on the outside of the siding. Lots of water went through that home before it was turned off and then nothing was done about it. So we went from, you know, our zero degree weather in January, February, March to our 70s and 80s humidity in April and May to our 90s in June with nothing being done to the interior of the property except for the gallons of water just doing their thing. So how long did it take that house to sell? Um, it was priced right. I think we had 19 offers on it. It was sold in a week or two. So frankly, guys, that's just a reminder to you that no matter what's happening in the market, there's always houses being bought and sold. The question is, does the price match the market conditions? And of course, we're filming this during the recovery beginning phases after the economic shutdown for coronavirus and nobody really knows what the after effects are going to look like so when you're in a market of uncertainty even a house that's full of colorful mushrooms and mold will sell if they have priced it to match the market and so when you saw it come back up on your facebook 
fee. Did you go look it up in the MLS and see in, who owns it? <laughs> I did. Unfortunately, there's a couple canceled listings. So I think that they um, flipped it and then just li- kept it for a while. So I, yes, I didn't, there wasn't very many good pictures, but I, they did a nice job. I've talked to the agent that sold it. So that's definitely realtor world though. We are <laughs> definitely the kids who got in trouble for being nosy as children because there is this irresistible urge to go look up a house you once sold and see what <laughs> happened to it and who owns it and has it changed hands or even the the spiteful busybody part of us that when we lose a listing or lose a buyer, you go look and you're like, I hope nobody else is able to sell it either. It's the worst <laughs> thing. We should never admit that, but we do it. We have a really strong investor market in Lincoln and they are all over each other to try and get those bought. So it is, we're lucky here that we have the strong investor market and keep our inventory in good shape too, because there's a lot of flips. So that's good for our buyers as well. If, if our inventory is staying in good shape and they're able to bring them back to life and sell them once again. So when you talk about a good investor market in Lincoln, Nebraska, what does that mean? Does that mean somebody from California could buy a house there and be an absentee owner and it will make sense? Or are there duplexes or multifamily? What do you define as a good investor market? What I define is we have investors who live in Lincoln. (laughs) I mean, we have a very large core group of investors who are invested in keeping our communities healthy. And so there, we do have some absentee owners, but most of our homes are owned by people right here in our community. Which I guess that's because part of the country doesn't seem to think Nebraska exists. So it's a good thing Nebraska homeowners (laughs) will take care of Nebraska homes. (laughs) We've been seeing multiple offers on everything for almost two years now. So even during coronavirus, because y'all never hit the full hardcore economic shutdown. Correct. Yep. I stopped working for about three weeks and by stopped working, that doesn't, as a realtor, you know what that means. That means uh, I only worked a couple hours a day instead of <laughs> yeah, 14. all day. Yeah. Right. So so, what, did, what did coronavirus do to the market in Lincoln? Unfortunately, we just don't have enough inventory just like everywhere else in the country. So Corona really hurt that even more because you have those sellers with different kinds of needs who may not want people coming through the houses or, you know, just a little gun shy about the market. So we just do not have enough inventory. And pretty much if you're working with a buyer, you can just tell them to expect to lose at least three or four before they get one. And there is going to be multiple offers. You have to look within hours of them hitting the market, anything under 300. I tell you what, that is definitely the, I think the hardest challenge for the first time buyer who maybe works an hourly job or they're a shift worker as a nurse and they want to buy a house and it comes on the market and the seller's got 12 offers within a couple of hours. They don't want to wait four days and the buyers can't always get off work. It's a very weird scenario. It's hard to go. So you have two kinds of listing agents. You have the kind that will just throw it up there and take offers as they come. So you could be under contract in two hours, or you have the listing agents who do a different kind of marketing and they say, okay, it'll be open for the next three days and then we'll take offers, you know, Sunday night at seven. So (laughs) there's pluses and minuses to both of those. And I don't know which I'd rather have. What do you do with your sellers? What's your preferred MO? Oh gosh, I, I tend to wait for offers, you know, just to give everybody an opportunity to get in there. I feel like that gives the, the seller the best display of what the market is. If they have a couple days and all different kinds of buyers have a chance to get in there and give their offers. That's what I tend to do. But when I'm working on the buy side, I'd rather let me get in there, write an offer and take it. (laughs) So the first time you ran into a multiple offer scenario or a bidding war, how did you learn how to handle it? Because that's something that's definitely not taught to new realtors when they come into the business. And it often depends on which brokerage you affiliated with as to what kind of uh, emotional and really good business support you get. Who taught you? Well, since I um, worked with foreclosures back in 08, that's really where I learned about negotiation and marketing and multiple offers. We were seeing them all the way back then with the investors. So I think 
I've learned a lot about human nature. And I think that's something we don't really think about enough as realtors about what, you know, what the human nature is and even the acceptance state. Some people get so bent out of shape about when the acceptance state is and, oh, we've got to make a decision before this acceptance state. Well, especially in this market with multiple offers, do you really think that buyer is going to walk away if you don't make that decision by that acceptance date? And everything in the contract is an agreement between the buyer and seller. So if they agree to let you accept their offer after their acceptance date, I don't, you know, (laughs) it's going to happen. So I think if somebody cares enough to write an offer, especially in this market, you as the seller have a lot of leverage. It's very true. And I always get entertained by buyers that are threatening to pull their offer off the table when we have 12 other offers. And I'm like, okay, I mean, but you're actually not showing us a whole lot of good faith that you're going to work with us during the repair and negotiation inspection process, because that's a whole separate ball of wax when that comes around and sellers take that stuff personally. Do you notice that too? That in a a tight market, it's a personal affront to receive some requests. (laughs) Well, I always tell my agents, don't get emotionally involved. You are there to broker the deal. You're there to keep everyone else calm. So you cannot get yourself emotionally involved. So you are just the go-between. The messenger, right? We're the messenger. Yes, Yes, correct. Dealing with people that you become good friends with, which makes it really hard. It's so funny (laughs) in real estate. Actually, that's helped me more than anything, really, you know? I think being involved in the community, knowing other realtors, that helps more than anything in multiple offer situations. I can attest to that several times, even in the last couple of months. It's definitely something that my my real estate goes back a few years prior to yours. And we did real estate in person and you were coming into the business, still a lot of the in-person before it went to all technology Correct. based. And we had smoother transactions when agents knew other agents because then the messengers were human. They weren't just somebody across a text bot. So I know you'll agree with me on this, that we wish more realtors would get involved at their realtor associations and volunteer more because the end buyer or seller is going to have a better experience with a realtor who's made some daggum friends out there. I agree with that 100%. And it's so it seems so counterintuitive. But once you're in it and see how it works, it really does. We're lucky we only have about a 1000 members in my local market. So we are pretty tight knit. And it it helps when you know the people across the table, you can just call them and have a conversation a lot easier than when you don't. But you can get really angry at somebody who's faceless, much less so if you know, where they like to eat breakfast and their kids went to school with your kids and you've seen each other in life, which frankly is why more people should just turn social media off period. That's a different discussion. (laughs) All right. So I know that's where most of my business comes from. (laughs) Right. But you know what I'm talking about? Yes. (laughs) The other kind of social media. (laughs) All right. So tell our listeners where they can find you if they're looking for realtor pro in Lincoln, Nebraska. I am Cell State Empire Realty in Lincoln. So you can search me on Facebook, Kim Zwiener, Z-W-I-E-N-E-R, Wiener with a Z, as my husband always likes to say. And Kim Zwiener Realtor, pretty much all my social media handles are that. And my phone number is 402-416-1889. So your husband spent his whole life perfecting that description of his last name? He did. And if you know my maiden name, you would, it was a step up. What was your maiden name? Seaman. Oh, <laughs> I mean, you must have had like the best wedding announcements and showers ever. <laughs> we, yes. <laughs> I mean, we got to laugh about it. That's all you can do. <laughs> It was funny. I was from a small town. And so it was just nobody thought anything of it because it was just always that way. Right. Really nothing crazy. 13 year old. That's when it's really funny. But it's a cocktail humorous. (laughs) It is. It's fun. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show. And by the way, thanks for all that you do to promote education amongst realtors and to build a positive network, which you do on social media in which you do with your political advocacy work in Nebraska. It's much appreciated. And the homeowners out there don't even know how much work you're doing, but they should totally find out and ask and demand the same of their realtor. Thank you. Phone bank tomorrow.
<laughs> oh, yay. Those are the yeah. most fun ever. I kind of love the excuses I get. That's my favorite part, but yes, it's always good for storytelling later. All right, friends. So reach out to Kim. All her contact information is in the show notes for this episode. And she can answer lots of questions for you about Nebraska real estate or about being a more engaged member of your social media community in a positive way. Kim, I will see you in person at some point whenever realtors can get together. Uh, yes. And who knows when that'll be, but I'm on my way. If y'all want me in Nebraska, I will get on a plane and come out tomorrow because I'm so tired of this. But anyway, if y'all got a story to tell about your own crazy life in real estate or you want to tell us about your wallpaper that was actually fungal growth, I'm at Lee Brown on Twitter or any of the social networks to be featured in a future episode. Just give me a shout. Let me know. And in the meantime, give me five stars and a subscription and I'll see you next time. If you are listening to this episode and you need to tell us something about your crazy life in or around real estate, then tweet me at Lee Brown or reach me on any of the social networks. That's if you're a broker, realtor, investor, inspector, lender, or just a regular normal human being who happens to have dealt in real estate. Subscribe for more episodes. And as always, we are thrilled that you joined us for some crazy shit in real estate. See you next time.